So today we're talking about George Kelly. So we had considered uh, the psychoanalysts who have a theory that's very, very internal in its determinants. And then we saw uh, radical behaviorism, Skinner, which is very external in its determinants. There's nothing inside the person. Then we saw um, uh, Dollard and Miller, who tried, at least, to fuse these two perspectives, the Freudian perspective and the radical behaviorist perspective, and at least you know, explain one in terms of the other. The degree to which they succeeded is questionable, but, but I mean, it, it reveals that these are not necessarily mutually exclusive perspectives and that they can work together in certain important ways. So George Kelly now is a, a pretty purely cognitive perspective um, that we will then combine with radical behaviorism under Albert Bandura's theory and look at his social cognitive learning theory on Thursday. So, uh, like I said before, Kelly's theory is uh, con convoluted and kind of hard to understand, but, but we're just going to break it down to its basic premise, right? So would you agree with any of this, that your reality is what you understand it to be? It's kind of an important ph philosophical idea, that your reality is what you understand it to be. Because you don't live in the real world. We have no access to what the real world is, what some philosophers call it, the phaneron you live in, you exist in, your understanding of what the real world is, filtered through your perceptions and your expectations and, and uh, your cognitive biases and so forth. Um, you have no re way of really understanding what exists beyond your understanding, right? So um, in, in a very basic level, very basic level, for example, of what I'm talking about, you see the world through visible light, right? Visible light's only a, a, a comically minuscule part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. There's other kinds of light that exist, ultraviolet light, infrared light, x-rays, th that are equally valid representations of the world, but you don't see those. So that's not your understanding of what the world is like. But if you could detect th those other wavelengths, then you would have a very different understanding of what, what the world is. So your understanding is, is limited in certain important parts, in certain important ways. And, and a more psychologically relevant uh, example of that is, do, like for, for example, me. Do you think you know who I am? I mean, I'm somebody who comes here twice a week and, and, and talks to you for 75 minutes, and maybe you've been in one of my other classes too. You probably have some idea, you think, of who I am as a person, right? But you're only seeing me at work, right? <laughs> Whenever you're seeing me, I'm working. I, I imagine many of you guys work, right? Um, are you the real you at work? Or are you putting on your workplace face? Are you putting on a persona? Especially if you work in a, in a service industry job, like, like you're a waiter, perhaps. Um, you're, you're probably putting on somewhat of a persona when you're at work. And the people who know you only in that limited context know that persona. But they don't know the real you. They don't know what you, you get up to when you're, you're out with your friends or when you go home with your family or when you're just by yourself, right? There's probably lots of aspects to your personality that you're not showing in those other contexts. They're seeing a very curated version of, of you. But that's the you that they think exists, right? That's their understanding of who you are as a person. For, for as, as all intents and purposes for themselves, that's who you are, even though it's a, a, it's a, um, it's a very limited aspect of who you are, a very selective aspect of, of who you are. So yeah, everybody understands the world through the lens of their own unique experiences. You bring your own biases in terms of interpreting the world and, and uh, other people in, in it, your, your social world uh, more specifically. 
uh, different people can interpret the same stimulus or event in different ways. Now, that's the basis of projective testing, right? We, we saw uh, the Rorschach inkblot test, or you might have the thematic apperception test, other kinds of uh, uh, projective tests where different people look at the same stimulus that could be interpreted in different ways, and they have different interpretations of it. Part of what they're doing is projecting some aspect of self onto the stimulus. But, but it reveals that, you know, different people come to the world with different life experiences, with different expectations, with different biases, with different values that they've acquired over the course of their lifespan, and that changes how they understand what they're encountering, well, how they make meaning of the world. People use what they know about the world to anticipate the outcomes of their choices they make, right? You, you do things that you do, like, for example, go to college and work real hard at what you're doing right now because you have some understanding of what the outcome is, is likely to be. And you have that understanding because you've picked that up from, again, your life experiences, the people that, uh, the people that you grew up with who've uh, uh, communicated their values and understandings to you. But different folks, maybe people from very disadvantaged backgrounds, might have a very different understanding of what the outcome would be for them of going to college. And so they don't make that decision. People's expectations about outcomes are what guide their behavior. Right, so you make the decisions based on your understandings about, about the outcomes. Um, so if all that makes sense, then I think George Kelly will probably make some sense to you. So to put him into this framework, what does he have to say about individual differences? Well, people differ in their personal, con in their histories, in their reinforcement histories, I suppose. Um, they're, not their reinforcement histories, their, their um, their experiential histories is what I should say. And in their, what he calls their personal constructs that they apply to their experience. Different people have different personal constructs. Different ways of understanding the world. Different cognitions. Other differences such as differences in emotions and in behavior follow from their different uh, personal constructs. What does he say in terms of adjustment? Well, um, constructs that can accurately predict the broad range of experience are more adaptive than those that predict the limited range of experience. Certain constructs are better than others at helping you navigate the world. And there's also uh, cognitive complexity. Some people have greater cognitive complexity that allows them to respond to situations or stimuli in more targeted, appropriate ways versus others who have low cognitive complexity who tend to overgeneralize um, and have a, a smaller toolbox, if you will, for how to relate to the world. In terms of uh, cognition, cognitive processes are central to his theory. It's almost entirely a cognitive approach. In terms of society and culture, um, Social relationships are facilitated when each person understands the other's constructs. It's helpful to know other people's perspectives because you, then you understand where they're coming from, how they understand you, how they understand shared experiences that they may have, just a different way of understanding um, an experience that you've both shared and that facilitates getting along with them. Uh, biological factors not considered explicitly in this theory and um, developmental wise not really a developmental theory either the focus is on adults for Kelly uh, but but children develop constructs for making sense of the world especially for making sense of people for making sense of their social world and they continue to use those constructs as adults until they no longer pre are accurate predictors <laughs> until they no longer work very well, in which case they're, they're likely to change them. So let me take a step back from George Kelly and review the basics of schema theory because this really is sort of the heart of what he's talking about. Um, so if maybe you've been exposed to this in other classes. The, uh, uh, the essential idea of schema theory, a schema is a theoretical mental structure. 
It's your organized knowledge about some aspect of the environment, some topic, um, uh, some uh, stimulus, some person. So you have a schema for police officers. You have a schema for UMass. Um, so let's say your, your schema for police officers um, includes, well, includes all the information that you know about police officers, about the topic that you have the schema for, so in this example, police officers. So it includes facts that they wear uniforms, that they uh, wear a badge, that they carry a pistol. Um, uh, your experiences with the police officer, with, with police officers. So if, if one's ever pulled you over and been nice to you, then your schema for police officers is that maybe that they're, they're nice, or at least they can be nice. Um, your attitudes toward them. Some people have positive attitudes toward police officers. They see them as helpers. Their understanding of the um, role of police officer influences their attitude toward the police officer. So some see them as facilitators, helpers. Others see them as punishers, law enforcers, and that might uh, alter their attitude. Um, how they relate to other constructs you have, other schemas you have. So how they relate to criminals, judges, the judicial system, politics maybe. So when you have a schema for a particular topic, that does a lot of things for you. It facilitates your understanding of the world. You don't have to consider every single given instance of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the construct as if, it were, as if it were new. Once you understand something, over there there's some chairs over there. I guess I should grab one and make it more salient. They're actually desks. They look like chairs from where I was standing. All right, so here, here's a desk, and all you have to do is glance at this thing, right? You don't have to scrutinize it and think about it carefully. You glance at this thing, and enough of the features of the thing are present to activate your schema for desks. And now you understand what that thing is. You understand why it's here, what its function is, what you could do with it, You don't have to very carefully scrutinize it, think about it, put a lot of cognitive effort into understanding it. You already know all that stuff. It fills in all those details for you. Uh, but they do other things for us as well. They tell us what to expect and what not to expect, making the world more orderly, predictable, and comforting in important ways. So, for example, you might have a schema for waiters. I'm going to use that one, uh, that example, uh, with some frequency. So, um, at a restaurant, a person comes up to you, and uh, there's some aspect of their presentation that activates the waiter schema. Um, perhaps it's their uniform. This is why waiters wearing uniforms is so important because it activates the waiter schema. Um, once it does that, now you know a lot about this person. You don't wonder why this guy is talking to you. You don't have to figure out who is it that's going to bring you your food. You understand immediately um, that uh, he's going to be the one to uh, refill your drink. Um, um, and you, have, you can figure all that out new without um, having to learn it again by generalizing from your waiter schema. Um, it doesn't matter what the guy looks like, right? It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, or, uh, a non-binary person. Once that person activates your waiter schema, you know what he's there for, you know what to expect of him, you know what not to expect from him. Um, you know that um, uh, He's not being friendly to you because he's hitting on you. You know that he's, friendliness is part of his job, so you know how to interpret his behavior properly. Um, schemas also help us to organize incoming information. Organize and interpret incoming information. For example, there's this object here on the screen. This is an object I saw being offered for sale on the internet. 
Anybody have any idea what that object is? It's hard to understand what it is because it doesn't really activate the appropriate schema, making it hard to understand what it is. Does anybody have any thought? I, in, the, in the back there, I saw your hand go up first. What do you think it is? Chair. Yeah, it's a chair. It's a chair. You might have to sit there and look at that for a while and think about it, and you, you, you're not sure, what, what, what am I looking at exactly? Is that, is that a model of the solar system? I, I don't know what that thing is. But, because you get no sense of scale either, right? So you're not sure how big it is. Um, but once I tell you it's a chair, you're like, oh, yeah, now I get it. I could see there's the backrest, there's the seat, there's the uh, armrests. Looks like it would scratch the hell out of your floor. There's no wheels or anything on it. Um, <laughs> But once, once I've given you the schema, I've told you it's a chair, or some aspect of the stimulus activates that schema, then you, can use, then you can use that schema to understand this thing here as a chair. So it helps you organize and interpret incoming information. Another example of that is, let's say you take a class in a subject that you've never been exposed to before. Let's say chemistry. You take your first chemistry class. And so it's, it's really hard. It's wicked hard because you don't have an understanding of the jargon and terminology, the nomenclature, well, what's all this with uh, chemical symbols and formulas and concepts that are unfamiliar. They're not knowledge structures that already exist in your mind. So you have to build those up from scratch. And that takes a lot of effort. And as you learn material from that chemistry class, you don't have hooks to hang it on in your mind. You don't have any information to relate it to, any um, body of knowledge to fill in the gaps, to help it make sense. But as you take more and more classes in chemistry, you develop that schema, and it becomes well elaborated. And new information later on becomes very easy to integrate because now you have a framework for understanding it. Helps to make it more clear, more understandable. Even let's say when you got an instructor who's not being too clear, you can fill in the gaps from your existing knowledge base and, and, and clarify it in your mind. That's all helpful. That's all really good. Schemas, schema, excuse me, fill in missing details and clarify ambiguity. So once you can fit a stimulus to a schema, it activates a given schema, now you can bring all the information that already exists in that schema to bear on understanding that particular stimulus. So once, once a guy activates your waiter schema, you, you don't, he doesn't have to make it explicit that he's going to take your order, that he's going to be the one to getting you a new fork if you should drop it, that uh, if you have any questions about the menu, you could ask him. Um, he doesn't have to explain to you that he's hoping for a tip or that his job requires him to be friendly. You know all that now because you know something about waiters and what they do and what their role is. Well, let's say you're watching a movie. You're watching a movie, and one character uh, is uh, introduced as another character's mother. Now that activates that schema, the mother schema. So now you can infer a lot about the relationship between these two characters. You know that they share some kind of close bond, that one of them is going to be, that they're going to be loyal to one another, that, um, that she raised him, that she helped form his values and his conscience, um, that he probably seeks her approval, um, that uh, she's likely to sacrifice for him, um, that she's much older than him. You know all that now because uh, you can infer all that from the schema. I got a video here, too, of... Um, of... Oh, of of bias, actually. I'm not sure why I put it in and fill, filling in missing details and clarify am, clarifying ambiguity. Um, it, this is an illustration of how it can lead you astray, too, in that you tend to see what you expect to see. So when a given schema is activated, you tend to perceive that stimulus in terms of uh, that schema. They direct your attention to what is schema relevant and 
aschematic features, things that don't fit the schema, tend to be ignored or, or not noticed or discounted. Um, so they do have this biasing effect. Um, so when you see somebody as a waiter, for example, you may fail to see that person in other ways. You may fail to understand that person is probably also a college student if they're a waiter in this area. Um, and in this example here, this is uh, from, I don't, uh, from, the, from the internet, from YouTube. Um, and it's uh, uh, called Undercover Lift. So apparently what's going on here is um, uh, uh, celebrities are posing as, as lift drivers and showing up. So you, like you call a lift and a celebrity shows up as your driver. And in this case, it's uh, uh, Patriots football player Rob Gronkowski, who is very hard to miss, right? <laughs> He's a very big, very distinctive guy. And in this case, he's got a very terrible disguise on. He's got a wig on and nothing else, really, to disguise his appearance. But apparently, people who, who find that Gronk came in, in, in as their Lyft driver get in the car and don't realize that it's Gronk. Um, just because they're understanding that driver through their Lyft driver scheme or whatever that is, and, and it's... Uh, directing their attention only to uh, schematic information and not to the aschematic information that would help them uh, realize that the guy is a famous football player. It's just a silly video. Let's take a look at it. I'm Rebecca Prince. Can you believe that there are actually people in New England who don't recognize Rob Gronkowski? I mean, he is kind of hard to miss. Gronk went incognito and jumped in the driver's seat for one of Lyft's undercover videos. Despite being six foot six and 265 pounds, all it took to fool a few Massachusetts residents was a pair of sunglasses, a slightly altered and somewhat awkward voice, some wigs, and a hat. Hi. Hey there. How are you? Good, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. Where are you from? I'm originally from Dallas. Ooh. One guy who had even claimed to have previously met Gronkowski was unaware of the fact that freaking Gronk was driving him around. What if you met Rob Gronkowski? I have met him. You have? Yeah, he's a great guy. Where? A bar downtown called Society on High. You did not meet him at Society on High. Gronk also told several passengers that he studied astrophysics, which came off about as believable as you'd expect. I mean, he still referred to Pluto as a planet. Come on, Gronk. What, what can you tell me about astrophysics? Like, black holes, <laughs> planets, Pluto. <laughs> Wow. Another standout moment is when he professed his man crush for his fellow Patriot teammate Tom Brady. I want to know what he puts on his skin. What is oh, it? Oh, man, I swear. He probably <laughs> puts this lotion on all the time after he showers. <laughs> I should have went there. No. What, you can't stop thinking about him putting lotion on his body? <laughs> Oh, I've always had a man crush on him. Of course, at the end came the big reveal and a whole lot of football spiking lessons. Take it and kabam it like this. Bam! Boom, baby! Boom! Boom! And you spike it like that. Oh, boom! It's hard to believe that these lift riders don't know that they're driving around with famous athletes in terrible disguises, but whether it's staged or not, it is still pretty entertaining. Now, before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for the best in sports news. No, thanks. All right. Um, uh, I don't know. Somehow my slide got a little out of order. But they also uh, guide behavior. So once, once you understand somebody as a waiter, you're likely to treat them as a waiter, for example. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we, but I started talking about biases. So if, for example, your, your schema for a waiter, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, includes being sarcastic and rude, maybe, maybe in, you come from a different culture where that's normative for waiters, um, then you're going to expect that behavior. And you're going to tend to see what it is you expect. So if the waiter um, uh, is 
too slow. You might think he's doing that deliberately. Uh, if the waiter smiles at you, uh, you might interpret that as a sneer. Uh, a simple question might seem like defensiveness or a challenge to you. Um, inconsistent behaviors, like him being nice or thoughtful, again, might be overlooked or dismissed. Um, uh, and you might selectively recall only the behaviors that are consistent with your schema, with your expectation. And it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy in that if you expect the waiter to be uh, rude, um, then you'll probably do things like react to what he says in a defensive way. You'll treat him like somebody you think is rude. And that might provoke the very rudeness you expected. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So to bring this back to George Kelly. So uh, Kelly assumed that people are like naive, what he called naive scientists, uh, or amateur, amateur scientists, uh, using what they know to try to understand their world as best they can. And they do so by applying personal constructs that, folk, that function much like schemas. Everybody has different constructs that are meaningful to them, ones that they tend to use to differentiate people, uh, understand them, uh, predict how they'll behave, um, uh, to know how to behave toward them. So people generally... Um, observe and try to make sense of their worlds. They build naive hypotheses about sort of how the world works, how, um, what things go together, um, uh, what are important features or aspects of the environment to watch out for, um, how things relate to one another, what they mean to you, and so forth. And, but they do it in a very personal, idiosyncratic, and biased kind of way. So they're naive scientists. They're not particularly good scientists. A lot of bias cre creeps into their understandings. So people you know, or people you meet, for example, um, you might tend to see through the lens of these constructs. When, like when you meet somebody new. It might be, um, it's, a question you might ask is, what constructs do you use? Like, for example, I'll use myself as an example again. One was the, when the first time you saw me, maybe the first day of class, what constructs did you use to help you understand me as a person? There's a lot that you could have used. You could have thought about, um, uh, understood me as a male, right, as a guy and used your, your, your male person schema. Or um, you could have seen me as a short guy. Um, whatever, whatever you think of short people, you might have used that to understand me. Uh, somebody who's middle-aged, perhaps. Or you might have used your um, uh, schema for a bearded guy. Or a um, uh, guy who wears too much jewelry. Uh, yes, I know I wear too much jewelry. I don't care. <laughs> I spent too much of my life um, letting other people make me feel self-conscious about my experience. Now I don't give a damn. I'm going to look the way I want. Um, but yeah, that might that might have been that might have activated a schema for you. Um, but what you probably used was something more uh, situational. There are various there are various situational cues that you could use. One is perceptual salience. Um, uh, excuse me, role. One is role. We'll start with role. Um, well, no, actually, let's start with perceptual salience. That makes a little more sense. So um, uh, salience means prominence. So whatever is prominent about the person. If you're, the person you're looking at is the only guy, for example, in a room filled with women, then that's probably going to tend to activate your guy schema for him. But the same guy, let's say he's, he's an old guy, the same guy who, if he were in a room filled with women, that would activate your guy schema, you put him in a room filled with young people of mixed genders, 
um, that's probably going to tend to activate, instead of your guy schema, now it activates your uh, old person schema, whatever, whatever that schema uh, contains. I guess I should talk in terms of constructs now. Construct, not schema. Um, so for me, you, what was activated was probably the role, though. It was probably the role, your professor schema, whatever that includes. And that tends to activate a clear behavioral script, right? Now you know a whole bunch of things about how to relate to me as a person, um, what, what to call me. Um, you know that I'm going to, uh, how I'm going to behave, that I'm going to lead class, and what my role is in this particular context. Um, and also it probably includes lots of other useful assumptions that are mostly true, right, from your professor schema that professors are intelligent, that professors are educated, uh, professors are, um, have some expertise, hopefully, in the, in the subject that they're teaching, right? It might, your professor schema, I keep saying schema, I mean construct. Your professor construct might contain other information that has a kernel of truth, such as, Professors might tend to be socially liberal, and so you might expect that of the particular press professor you're meeting, but, but not all are, right? And if I'm the exception, it would probably take you longer to uh, realize that than if you didn't have that expectation about me. Some information in your, your professor construct comes from pure bias, maybe from uh, stories you've heard uh, from other people or from your past experience with other instructors. So maybe people have told you that I'm a mean and cruel guy. Or maybe you've had past experience with other instructors who've been cruel or sadistic. So again, that may bias your interpretation of my behavior. You might uh, see a smile as a scowl or a smirk. You might think the assignments I give you are intended to make you miserable rather than to facilitate your learning. You might um, think that a poorly worded exam question was uh, me being intentionally mean, trying to trip you up rather than a normal human mistake. So beyond that, beyond that, what other constructs can you use beyond the situational ones? Um, there are all kinds of ways, as I said before, but um, the ones that are important to you for some reason tend to be chronically accessible constructs. The ones that are personally relevant, certain constructs you just tend to use all the time. Um, gender, age, and um, uh, race are ones that seem to be chronically activated for, for uh, most people, if not all people, um, ones that people can't seem to avoid using. You're talking to a little kid, it's hard not to understand that person as a little kid versus, let's say, a middle-aged adult or versus an old person. You probably see and use age as an important construct for understanding other people. Um, but beyond that, what, what do you tend to use? Uh, probably stuff that, for whatever reason, is relevant to you. Let's say you're a basketball coach and you're always sizing people up by their height, so you might have noticed that I'm short. If you're the kind of person who has problem with shyness, and um, that's something very relevant in your life, you might have noticed the same indicators that I'm a shy person as well. Um, so people aren't particularly good, like I said, naive uh, scientists. They're susceptible to a lot of bias, a lot of confirmation bias, seeing what they expect to see, in part because it's comfortable to have your, ex your constructs validated. Um, and it's threatening to have them called into question because that means you're not interpreting the world correctly if you start to see evidence that your constructs um, may not be uh, valid. So you're biased, you're motivated to see them, to see the world uh, uh, as accurately fitting your constructs. Um, also, 
interpersonal relationships tend to be facilitated by understanding each other's constructs, like I said before. So I understand we are coming from better. I have a better sense of how to act toward you if, if I know what your perspective is, if I understand that your professor schema includes, let's say, being mean or cruel. Um, oh, I had, I had a personal experience with this, um, with another faculty member um, years ago, um, serving, on, serving on a committee. Uh, I'll tell you who it was, it doesn't matter, it was Adrian Staub. And I was serving on this committee and um, I had not met Adrian before. And um, he joined that committee. So the first time we met, uh, Adrian was there and I was there. And nobody thought to, in, it was sort of expected that we knew each other even though we didn't. So nobody thought to introduce us or anything like that. So we're just both on this committee together. And it didn't meet very frequently. And I, but when it did meet, I noticed Adrian never looked at me, talked to me, addressed me in any way, didn't say hello, didn't say goodbye, basically kind of ignored me every time we had this committee meeting. And you know, because of my own history, I'm seeing that as, oh, I'm being snubbed. I'm being snubbed, the, the, the bullying thing is, is starting up again, right? And I was, I was kind of hurt by that. Um, but, but I kind of wrote it off. I, I was thinking, well, is it, is, it, is, it, is it a status thing? Is it because he's the tenure line guy and I'm a lecturer? I, I didn't know what to make of that. Um, but then, then, then he, he got a different committee assignment and I didn't see him again for, for a long time. And then we were at a social event. Um, it was actually the, um, the psych department's reception after commencement. So it's, it's an awkward thing for faculty to go to because students are there with their parents and with their family and so we're kind of expected to mingle but it's weird <laughs> to mingle. I mean, I don't know any of these folks and they, you know, they, it feels intrusive to be talking to them at this, at, in this moment. So what faculty end up really doing is kind of huddling together at, the, at this event and talking among themselves. And I was there and Adrian was there and he's commenting on sort of the cringy, awkward nature of us, uh, of us being there. And he says, yeah, it's, it's particularly awkward for me because I'm just really shy. And I, in, in that moment, it clicked, I was like, and I actually blurted out, oh, you're shy. All this time I thought you were an asshole. <laughs> and, and, and now it made sense. It activated that schema for me. And now, oh yeah, all of Adrian's behaviors made total sense. I mean, I was kind of acting the same way towards him, right? I wasn't talking to him either because I'm shy and we, I, we never got introduced. And I was like, oh, now it all makes sense. It, it turns out that, that He's a very nice man, and we get along very well now. Um, uh, just, I, I misunderstood him. This, this often happens by, I should have known better, because this often happens with people who are shy, right? They, they tend to act, they, they act in ways, they, they're aloof, they don't make eye contact, um, they don't react the way other people react, they're, not, they're not, not likely to engage others, and that often gets interpreted as, um, arrogance or snobbishness um, and that's another example of how personal relationships can be helped by understanding each other's constructs by understanding where other people are coming from so one thing I do sometimes to try to diffuse that I know that people are going to do that so I, I will disclose to people look I, I'm, I'm kind of awkward I'm, I'm shy I don't mean to be but that's that's just um, that's just how it is. And, and so that they make the right attribution for the behavior. Another thing I learned from committee meetings, totally unrelated, I guess, but it, it's something I have to do a lot for the, I mean, I've been doing it, uh, all, it's part of my job, so I've been doing it for many years, uh, sitting in on these committees and, and nobody wants to be there, right? It's work, nobody wants to be there. So it's not exactly fun or sociable or pleasant. Um, and, and people aren't generally being terribly sociable. They're being polite, but not sociable at these things. And I noticed, that there's actually research on this that I, uh, I never had applied before, but I noticed that um, if I act 
like I'm happy to see people. Like when they walk in the room uh, to, the, to the meeting, if I'm like, hey, Bob, how you doing? If I smile at them and act like I'm genuinely happy to see them, um, that makes people like you better. That is very powerful. There's research on this that shows reciprocity of liking. You tend to like people who like you. Um, and that's really powerful. It doesn't work in the moment. It doesn't really do anything that moment. But when you do that with some frequency, you're always a appearing to be happy to see people. By the end of like a semester, they're treating me much, much more warmly, I notice, than, than they otherwise, otherwise would have. Just, just a little personal application, I guess. And I don't know why I'm talking about this, because I'm thinking about committees, that's why. Anyway, what we want to do now is, uh, last thing we want to do is uh, a handout. So uh, could I have the undergrad TAs kindly distribute this handout? This is a reaction paper. This is George Kelly's role construct repertory test. This was his way of understanding what people's constructs are. Can't really ask them. They don't have insight into that. So he devised this technique for determining. Thanks, you guys. I'll take one. I'll, give me one. Give me one. Just, just one. Just one. <laughs> All right. So don't hang on to any extras. We only have just enough for everybody. This is a little bit convoluted. So you do put your name on it first, and then you do part one. Just do part one. You can't do part two yet. We go to 45, right? We got half an hour? Okay, good. If you get extras, just hold them up. One of my TAs will come and get them. If you need one, raise your hand. They'll, they'll come and bring you one. So for right now, just do part one. It asks you to come up with uh, two first-degree relatives. That's like uh, your parent, your sibling, or your child. You, you guys probably don't have children, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll let you write in uh, grandparents, too. You can write in your grandparents if you want. So grandparent, parent, sibling, a child. Then two extended family members, aunts, uncles, cousins. Two friends and two acquaintances. Don't use me. Don't use me as your acquaintance, please. It's weird. Don't use me. this work? Uh, no, apparently not. Well, shit. Okay. Um, all right, here's what we'll do. All right, so next... Uh, I have to improvise here. Next uh, step is I need uh, Paul. Paul, give me a number between uh, one and eight. Six. <laughs> Somebody else is answering for you, too. You said six. One year I asked, Paul's my TA. One year I asked my TA, give me a number between one through eight, and he confidently shouted out nine. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> does not inspire confidence. Sierra, give me a number one through eight, not six. Three? Three. Um, uh, Devin, give me a number one through eight, not three or six. Two. All right. Now, uh, 
Uh, very attentive guy with the, with the orange hat. What, what, give me a number one through eight, any number. Four? Four. Uh, person next to you, <laughs> give me a number one through eight, not four. Five. And person next to you, a number one through eight, not, not four or five. Seven. Okay. And um, we'll just go down the line. One through eight, any number. One. Excellent. And next person, three. And next person, eight. Okay. And we need, uh, yeah, we need uh, three more. Next person, one through eight. Two. Yeah. Next person, any number but two. Four. And last person, any number but two or four. One through eight, two or four. Not two or four. Five. Good. All right. So here's what we're going to do. It's, it's a little bit uh, tricky to comprehend. Let me try to explain this carefully. So you've got a, a grid, right, in part two. And um, the grid says, on one side says construct, and on the other side says contrast. And then there's uh, num boxes numbered one through eight. For each line of the grid, what I want you to do is, for the first line, take persons six, three, and two. So it would be uh, one of your two friends, that would be friend number, person number six from part one, and person number three is one of your two extended family members, and person number two is one of your two first degree relatives. Take those three particular people, two, three, and six. Decide what it is that makes any two of them similar. It could be anything you want. Anything that makes any two of them similar. Something that you can describe in a word. Maybe two words at most. That's your construct for that line, for the first line. Put right that in the construct box. Then, then, Whichever two you picked and said are similar, there's a third person, the odd one out. What makes that person different from the first two? Does this make sense? So let's say you picked persons two and three, and you said they're similar because they're smart. All right? What makes person six different from two and three? Maybe dumb. <laughs> but maybe something else. It could be whatever you want. So you are creating a, a dichotomy, smart versus dumb. And then you do the same thing for the second row, only now it's persons four, five, and seven. For the second row, it's persons four, five, and seven. Pick two, any two you want, that are similar in some way, and specify as the construct what it is that makes them similar. And then the third person, you say what it is that makes them different, and that's the contrast. Then similarly for lines three and four, does anybody have questions? Yeah, what? All right, yes. But we're not there yet. Hold off doing that. Hold off the numbers yet. Hold off on the numbers for now. Just, you're just specifying the construct and the contrast for now. The, the boxes with the numbers, we'll get to it. That's a different instruction. I don't want to confuse people with too many instructions. So do the uh, constructs and the contrast first. Because this is a little bit convoluted, I know. <clears throat> Any other questions about it? Anybody unclear what they're doing? Apparently I've gotten better at explaining it because <laughs> in past semesters it's taken a while to get people to understand. Can you read the screen all right in the back? 
I guess so. How many of you are still working on that? Still working on that? Okay, a few people. All right, so the next thing, the next thing is also a little convoluted. But so now, let's say for the first line, again, you've got your construct and your contrast. Let's say your construct is smart and your contrast was dumb. As a hypothetical, you got your own, right? Um, so now you know that persons 6, 3, and 2, right, um, Two of them are smart and one is dumb because you base that on those three people, right? So in the boxes for six, three, and two, you put a plus for the two who match the construct and a minus for the one who matches the contrast to indicate which two are uh, uh, the construct and which one, which one was the third one, the odd one out, that you said is the contrast. Then you try to do the same thing for all the other boxes. So people who aren't uh, 6, 3, and 2, persons 1, 4, 5, 7, and 8, can you put a plus or a minus in their boxes? Can you say whether they're smart or dumb? Can you do that? And can, if so, can you do it easily? Can you readily do that? If you can readily do that, this might be an important construct for you. This might be one that is probably chronically accessible, or at least an important one that you use to um, understand the world, that may be why it was the first one that you thought of in doing the earlier part of the uh, exercise. Um, so if you can readily categorize all the other people in terms of that construct contrast dichotomy that might be an important personal construct for you and if you can't then maybe it was um, maybe it's not maybe it was just spurious so see see which of the four dichotomies you can readily apply to the other people So for line two, you used four, five, and seven. So you see for the other people, one, two, and three, six, and eight, can you readily categorize them? If so, then that may be a, an important personal construct for you. And once you figured all that out, you could do part three, the reflection. So which dichotomies were easiest for you to fill in? made sense to you, you could readily use them to understand other people. Um, and are those, do those seem to be 
important personal constructs for you. Why or why not? Any questions about that? Yeah, I know, it's not exactly clear. It's a weird task. What, what's up? What do you think? For what? I can't quite hear you. Sorry. Well, if you say they're, it's anything that you want, anything that comes to mind. So no, it doesn't have to be their trait characteristics. But if you say they're blood related, well, that, that's going to be part that's, 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 that's built into the thing. Because some of them are family members, right? So that, that's, that's, for lack of a better word, a cop out, <laughs> right? Yeah, so use something other than blood related. But, um, I mean, if you've, already, if you've already done it, then don't change it. It's fine, but it's just not going to work very well. But anything you want, yeah, it could be anything you want. It doesn't have to be trait characteristics. It could be trait characteristics. Any, any other questions? I know it's a convoluted task. It's weird. This was Kelly's way of trying to understand what people's constructs were. And when you are done with all that, you, you've answered the reflection questions, um, we're done. I, I, like I said, we're, we're done a little bit early, I think. Um, normally I had to leave more time for this reaction paper in the past because it's a little bit confusing for people, but you guys seem to have grasped it pretty readily, so that's great. So we got a little extra time, that's okay. Just turn those in to the uh, uh, TAs on your way out.